In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for bringing us safely to your sanctuary today. On this day of resurrection, we give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. We thank you for our gift of salvation, Lord Jesus. Father, as we delve into your word for study today, we pray that the message that you have for us is received, Lord God. We thank you for divine revelation, Father. I submit myself humbly before you as the teacher today as the mouthpiece for the word that you have to deliver to your children. We thank you, Father God, for wisdom and understanding. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. All righty, Pastor Fe has shared in the chat the message on hospitality. That's our lesson for today, lesson 32. Our opening prayer is that God will help us to never be weary in doing what he's called us to do, never be weary in doing well for others. So before we get started, who can tell us what hospitality means, what it means to be hospitable? Toby. Can we have a microphone, please? Receiving, receiving someone with, with warmth and with love. Nice. Warm reception, being open, receiving someone with love. Excellent. I think that's a really great place to start. Our lesson text for today is in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 18. And we'll get someone to read that as we take another contribution from the audience and what it means to be hospitable. Can we have a microphone, please? I think it means to having the gift to, it's a gift, I think. Uh, and you can also earn or learn that gift to be able to be, able to be accommodating and to serve. Um, I think hospitality is the ability to serve, is a gift. It's not everybody that knows how to serve or to be you know, available for service. So um, I think hospitality is the ability to serve and to be available to serve. Thank you. Thank you for that. Alrighty, lots of great contributions and we'll keep taking Contributions from the audience today. Um, our lesson text in 2 Kings 4, 8 through 18. And we'll read through that together. If you all have the verse, the manual open, the memory verse is 1 Peter 4, verse 9. And we can recite it together. Use hospitality one to another without grumbling. First Peter chapter four, verse nine. We'll say it again. One, oh sorry, <laughs> one, two, three. Use hospitality one to another without grumbling. First Peter four, nine. Who wants to give a shot at reciting it without looking? He's got it memorized. It's a really simple one today, but very profound. Go ahead, Mary. Use hospitality to one another. Without grumbling. Without grumbling. Out grumbling. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. Alrighty. So it says that hospitality 
is the friendly and generous reception and entertainment of a guest, visitors, or strangers. To be hospitable is to offer a home away from home, to meet needs and offer rest to those in need. Paul urged the Corinthian brethren to shelter and support his brother, one of the brothers in Christ, during his visit to the church of Corinth. In Philippians 2, verse 28 through 30, that's where that occurred. It is our prayer that the Lord will help us to make our home a happy welcome place for guests and visitors in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Alrighty, so we're going to read through 2 Kings. We're reading from 2 Kings chapter 4. We're going to read from verse 8 through 18. And that's, then we're going to di- um, dissect it verse by verse with the lesson aim being to learn the blessings of being hospitable. There are three objectives in this lesson, to give reasons why believers should be hospitable, to enumerate at least three homes that Jesus Christ was uh, visited, and to give five examples of people who gave others hospitality in the scripture. So as we go through it, that's our goal, and participation is key for us to understand what blessings we have to receive from being hospitable so can i have a few volunteers uh for the verses we're reading in second kings and if we can have the folks on the mic ready so we've got lisa odun we've got our doctor tt was that a hand as well Alrighty. So, okay, we'll do these two just so it's easier for the microphone. Um, All righty. So if you want to read until verse 12, and then TT can read the rest. Thank you. Um, Second Kings 4, verse 8 to 12. One day, Elisha went to the town of Shunem, a wealthy woman lived there, and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for something to eat. She said to her husband, I am sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. One day, Elisha returned to Shunem, and he went up to this upper room to rest. He said to his servant Gehazi, tell the woman from Shunem, I want to speak to her. Then she appeared. Verse 13, Elisha said to Gehazi, excuse me, tell her, we appreciate the kind concern you have shown us. What can we do for you? Can we put in a good word for you to the king or to the commander of the army? No, she replied. My family takes good care of me. Verse 14. Later, Elisha asked Gehazi, what can we do for her? Gehazi replied, she doesn't have a son and her husband is an old man. Verse 15. Call her back again, Elisha told him. When the woman returned, Elisha said to her as she stood in the doorway, Verse 16, next year at this time, you'll be holding a son in your arms. No, my Lord, she cried. Oh, man of God, don't deceive me and get my hopes up like that. Verse 17, but sure enough, the woman soon became pregnant. And at that time, the following year, she had a son, just as Elisha had said. Verse 18, one day when her child was older, he went out to help his father who was working with the harvesters. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, guys. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. All righty. So what can you guys, what are some first impressions from this story, this passage that we just read? Can we 
we have a microphone over there. I mean, I will say, uh, maybe the first one, the woman wasn't expecting anything. Because sometimes when people are hospitable, they expect people to do the same to them. But obviously, she, was, she just gave her all and she wasn't expecting anything, so to say. Although, you know, she got something, but that wasn't her intention. Her intention was just to um, be of help to the, to the servant of God, and that was it. But, you know, so it, sometimes, like I said, um, the emphasis is on not expecting, you know, people to do the same. Just do whatever God led you at and move on. Excellent. Thank you. In addition to, um, it's also, um, what also I jumped out is she made herself available. She saw a need and she made herself available to, to um, fill that need, you know. So um, as much as what Pastor Shola said, there was also a need and she, she attended to it. Praise the Lord. Wonderful. Two excellent points I want to emphasize. Expectation. So your motive for serving, for making yourself available, as Pastor Tenney was saying, we're observing in this passage that her motive for serving wasn't to be rewarded. Like her needs were already being met. Her family was taking care of her. And so she wasn't blessing this man of God to be blessed. It was her heart posture was one of service. And in the process, by doing, by subscribing to the principle of service and having a service mentality, she was blessed by the man of God. And so as we're going through it and learning the benefits of being hospitable, let's not be confused. We're not doing it in order to be blessed. We're doing it because of the desire to serve God first and foremost, and knowing that when we bless his children, he is always going to bless us because that is who our father is. Um, so as we continue to go through the passage, let's take a few more contributions on other things that folks have observed in the section that we just read. In our age and time, um, many people, they can be hospitable if it's for a while. When it becomes habitual. So because the Bible says that as often as this man of God passes by, he will drop by to come and eat. So it just jumped at me that, yeah, in our own age and time, people are happy, okay, it is for this one time or twice. But when it becomes a habit, it, <laughs> there might be a problem. That's one thing that jumped at me. And then the second one is the fact that there was total agreement between the wife and the man. It speaks a lot about the dynamics within that family that the wife can desire to do a good work and the husband throw his, his full support behind her. I think that also jumped very strongly at me. a few more hands. Thank you. Even though she had a need, um, it was actually Gehazi that brought forth what, you know, she, what her prime need was that she didn't even raise. Um, it shows a lot that, to your point, service. And also, um, this was an opportunity for her to have just asked. It was like a blank check. Ask for anything you want but somebody else had to raise it. It shows a level of humility and also not just being overly concerned about some of our personal pains, which a lot of times we tend to be more concerned about our, uh, our worries, which is normal, uh, but a good reminder to be less concerned about it because when we're not solely focused on our own needs, God has a way of really going all out to take care of our needs. Yes, and just to underscore that, 
what she focused on was the resources that she had already. She focused on what she had to give and less what she wanted to receive. And when she was blessing pe the people, the men of God, when she was blessing Elisha, again, she wasn't thinking like, oh, it's because I want a child. She was thinking, I have a home. I have, you know, food to give. I have a husband who can help me in helping these people. And like Pastor Valeria was saying, the husband also had a heart that was willing to serve when his wife guided him. So it's key who you're surrounding yourself with, who you're yoked to. It's key to understand what you've already been blessed with and how it is that you can use those blessings to bless people around you. And God will supply the need. He's going to be the one that answers it, even when you don't see it, even when you've given up on having that need met. He's going to bring someone along. And when you position yourself by doing his work, he's going to take care of the rest of the things for you. So excellent. We're right on the money. Let's keep it going. Stamina was another point that Pastor Bolade brought up. Uh, it's important not to grow weary in doing the work of our father. Uh, sometimes, like he was mentioning, it's easy to do a nice thing every once in a while. It's easy to do a nice thing like for one person that one time in one-off situations. But I think the key here is making a habit of doing God's work, making a habit of serving others, of meeting the needs of those around you, um, not in a people-pleasing way, but in a, God, like what you've given me, how do I use it to help the people that you're bringing across my path? All righty. Let's keep it going. So we've discussed how the woman persuaded her husband to join in the hospitality. But even if we take a step back, she had to persuade Elisha to eat some food. In verse 8, we see that. And by eating, that's when Elisha became a regular visitor to her home. So before I like unpack that, does anyone have any contributions on what they see the significance of that being? And I'm leading a little bit here. Yes. Um, I was just going to say that. So there's one aspect where in meeting the needs of people, they ask, and then you're able to meet their need. But like in this situation, he probably, that the writer didn't, Elisha, sorry, didn't ask, but she was able to discern that this is what this man of God needs. Maybe he was very, you know, just concerned about the work of God and, you know, didn't even think about eating. I mean, I mean, we all know that food is a basic necessity, but sometimes people neglect that aspect of their life. So it was great for her to be able to discern that this is what he needs. And then to actually, like the Bible says, urge him to eat, knowing that he needed to do that. Yes. Thank you. The key takeaway there being a spirit of discernment. So back to the earlier point, we're not just doing things because they make us feel good, because we like the person, because like they're a person of stature. No, like we're letting the Holy Spirit guide us to what God, how God wants us to serve in his kingdom and who he wants us to serve and in what way he wants us to serve them. So sometimes when you're caught up in doing God's work and if your focus is on him, he's going to use your brothers and sisters in Christ and others around you to meet the needs again that you're not conscious of. And so it behooves you to be very conscious of what the spirit is moving you to do. Does, does that make sense? Or? Alrighty, 
Okay. <laughs> I need some feedback. Go ahead. Can we have a microphone here, please? God bless you, uh, Sister Jade. But I think it underscores one thing. It takes somebody who is not overly focused on themselves alone to identify the needs of others around them. In this age and time of ours, uh, most of us are more interested in so long as I'm comfortable and I can maintain my territory, everybody else can sort themselves out. But I think this woman, the way she's described, she's a wealthy woman. Mm -hmm. So ordinarily, you know how wealthy people stay in the posh areas and you they, they, they're separated from everybody else, kind of. But this one had a heart that, God, I thank you for what you have given me, but she's looking around, who can I affect, who can I bless with what I've been blessed with. So I think it's underscored something for us that we should always think beyond ourselves mm -hmm. and, and, and be mindful of others. I mean, if you get on the typical New York City subway, you see a seat that can take eight people, and you see four people who shouldn't ordinarily cover that seat. They, but they don't care whether every other person is standing when they can adjust themselves and let others sit. I hope we're not that person on the train. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Okay. Yeah, I, I wanted to say something to what you said about being led uh, to give. Uh, so, I think we need to let the Holy Spirit guide us, you know, so that we can meet the real need. Because we can, if we want to do it by the flesh, we may miss it sometimes. So, I, I, there was a time when I was going back for my master's, and I was going to be living on campus. So, I needed to buy a lot of things. And I had bought almost everything that I would need. But I realized I had not bought plates. Those were the last thing that I hadn't bought. So I was like, oh, I'll buy it when I get to where I'm going. Then in church on that Sunday, the pastor's wife came and she said, I know you're going away. I thought of what to give you. And nothing came to mind. But I looked around. And I found these plates. And I thought to give them to you. <laughs> Imagine how, she said, I know it's insignificant. It's not, you know, I just can't think of anything else. It's the only thing that came to mind. And I know it wasn't just her who did that. That was God. He met my need. So when, don't, so when it comes to your mind, when God is laying in your mind to give somebody something, no matter how insignificant the thing might look to you and say, oh, I don't think they would need this. I think this is too small to give. It's not yours to determine. Just do as you're told. Amen. What a testimony. Yes. And the key there and also in this passage in verse 8, Elisha didn't go to the town of Shunem seeking out this woman. He went there on assignment, and the woman found, like, came up cross him and urged him like come let me take care of you let me give you something to eat and then in verse 10 she she and her husband she said let let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed a table a chair and a lamp then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by so now this man who was just doing what he was told by God met a woman who was just doing what she was told by God. And that's how the kingdom was built to work, for all of us to be in alignment, to be in a, attuned with what the Holy Spirit is guiding us to do so that we can bring plates for people like Pastor K when we don't even understand why we're being told to bring plates, but we're showing up with plates. So thank you for that testimony. Um, we'll keep on going. So why should you be hospitable? You should be hospitable because God commands it. So if we can turn to Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 19. Alrighty. 
Excellent. It says, so you too must show love to foreigners, for you yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. In school of disciples, we're learning that the disciple is a pilgrim. Um, you know, we are just passing through this world, doing what God has called us to do. And it's important if you understand that, you know, you were a foreigner in a place and, and you approach it with a heart of gratitude for all those who, you know, came out to support you, then it behooves you to do the same for others. Um, and if we can have some volunteers for the next less, uh, the next points in the outline here for why you should be hospitable. We're gonna, the next one is going to be Genesis 18, verse 2 through 14. But before we get there, can we have some contributions on why people think that we should be hospitable? I think the story of the Shunammite woman is a great example that highlighted a few reasons why. So if, we, if you either want to restate some of the reasons discussed or some other reasons that have not been touched on, why should we be hospitable? Praise God. Um, something that came to mind was in the New Testament when Jesus was like, oh, you, I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I, I didn't have shelter, you didn't house me. Like, I didn't have clothes, you didn't clothe me. So I think that as Christians, specifically like New Testament Christians, showing that type of hospita hospitability and care towards people, it's, it's demanded because if we don't do it to others, that means we are effectively like not doing it unto God. So it's it's a fundamental tenant as New Testament Christians to do that. Praise God. Um, yes. Um, in addition to what uh, Deborah said, I think it's just a way of showing people that we care. Um, and uh, there's no better way uh, when somebody needs something uh, and you're there and you show up and, and you care. In addition to preaching the gospel, I think that kind of draw, um, it drives home the point more. It's easy for you to then follow up with telling somebody about God if you've shown them uh, or cared for them about a need that, they, that needed to be met through hospitability. Thank you. Yeah, as we pass the mic over, yeah, there's a, an idiom. Um, people don't care what you say until they, or people don't know that you care until, no. I'm butchering it. Ah, they don't care what you know until they know that you care. Thank you, Brother Toby. He was supposed to be the one to hand this up. <laughs> Praise God. Um, can we have a microphone over to, I think Pastor Bolliday had his hand up. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that um, when we are hospitable, it helps us to be more credible witnesses to Jesus, right? Because you are coming with a message of God loves you, God cares for you, God will provide for your needs. But here you are, you are God's agent on earth. And you are not doing the bidding of your principal. If you, who is the agent of a principal, you are telling me your principal cares, your principal. Will, and I'm not seeing you doing that, right? You about have a way. They say the person who is going to sew a cloth for you, you first look at what he's wearing. So, so I think... It reduces our witness. If indeed we are children of our father, and our father that we are marketing to people, is caring, is giving, and we are not that, then it, 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 it negates our witness. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I remember um, a sister of mine shared with me that um, she went out to evangelize and... Um, she was sharing tract, and a guy went out grocery shopping and had his hands full, and she was trying to pass the tract to, to him. And the guy said, with what hand? <laughs> with what hand? You're not even offering to help, and you see that I'm struggling. And with what hand will I check, take the tract? So it's, it's um, important for us to be a very good ambassador 
of Christ by being hospitable. We, we, not, we look at the need, you access it, and then what is needed first, you do. You don't do the last thing first. For example, in that situation, helping the guy, saying, can I help, will be the first way to even interact, and then you're already selling Christ to the person without you saying a word. Preach the gospel if necessary, use words. Yes, if you want to. Can you pass the mic to Pastor Frank, please? I think it's also a commandment. God commands us, requires of us. Um, Romans 12, 13. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. So it's required of us. You know, it's whether it's not whether I'm able to, and I, like I said earlier on, no matter our ability, we are able to help somebody else, even if you are being helped, right? We, we people tend to think that they are in need, so they are in, and they are not capable of rendering any help to anyone. They are the ones to always receive. Um, we should always look that even if we do need assistance, no matter how precarious our situation is we are also able to offer help to another. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes. Um, if we, if you're just speaking words and then the opportunity to demonstrate what you're preaching comes up and you don't take the opportunity to demonstrate it, then whoever you're speaking to is going to, you lose credibility, you lose your audience when you have an opportunity to demonstrate what you're preaching and you're not practicing it you lose folks that way go ahead sister Lynn. Thank you. Uh, i just remembered that um in the african culture there is a word called ubuntu which is um the sense of humanity um i am because you are so the word of God uh, speaks to us that we should do unto others what we would have them do unto us. So I think culturally, we have to practice hospitality and the word of God speaks to us about that. So we expect people to do good for us, so we should as well do good for them. Amen. Amen. Yes. Uh, Having cultures of hospitality is a great way to instill that value into your children and then grounding it in the ways to be hospitable and how to be guided by the spirit is how we bring it back to doing everything that we do onto God in the way that he has called us to do it. Thank you guys for the contributions. Um, so in Genesis 18, 2 through 14, this is when um, God visited Abraham and they were fellowshipping and you know he's offering he said that he's going to bless Sarah with a child um Sarah was being hospitable and then when her blessing came she laughed at it so let's not be like Sarah in that moment as we're serving if someone offers to bless us for our service even though we're not doing it to be blessed let's again with you know like hearts open to receiving what God is giving us, receiving the help that he's giving us through the people that he's giving us it through. Um, that's another portion of the lesson as well. Um, and the purpose of all of this is onto God's glory. So serving people is to demonstrate the word, demonstrate the gospel, demonstrate the things that we're preaching. Um, and it, helping someone is the easiest on-ramp. You know, like you meet a man at the point of his needs and you've, you've got an ally. Um, and so if you can identify through the spirit someone's need and you allow the spirit to enable you to meet that need, uh, that's how we're going to bring folks into the kingdom. And in Matthew 25, verses 34 through 40, this is where Jesus, uh, Deborah was actually touching on this. This is where Jesus is telling us how, like, who's inheriting the kingdom. Um, he's talking to us about the final judgment. And, you know, those that will inherit the kingdom are those that saw his needs while he was here and met them. Like, they supported him. Um, 
So actually, if we can turn to Matthew 25, verse 34, so we can read that. And if we can have a volunteer to read, that would be great. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Amen. What can we take away from that passage? Praise the Lord. So I think one thing I noticed was like equity, because it says like when you do it to the least of this, my brothers. Um, So like it doesn't matter who you're being hospitable to. It doesn't matter if the person is like, you know, the highest person in that air, like, you know, a leader versus like someone that's just not really recognized or popular. Like as long as you're doing it from like a good heart, God sees it, you know. Praise God. Yes, he sees our heart. He sees when we are doing his work, and he's eager to bless us for that. Um, Let's go to lesson outline B. Christ is entertained in various homes. Who can tell us some of the homes that Christ was entertained in while he was with us in the flesh? Yes. Abraham. Okay, so for the folks online, we've got Mary and Martha's house. We've got the house of Zacchaeus. From Pastor Paladi, Peter's mother-in-law. <laughs> Peter's mother-in-law. Excellent. So we're, we are aware of these examples. So when someone comes to town and they're looking for a home to stay in, why? what are some re- excuses that we make um, for why we can't host them? Safety, okay. Do you want to tell us more? <laughs> you know, it's in this day and age where on social media you see many things go left. So you think about your family safety first. This person that is just coming for the first time, and it's not like someone that knows someone that knows someone. This is a person that you have never met before. To um, to let that person stay will be a little bit, you know, hard because, I mean, you think about safety. You want your family to be safe. You don't know who this person is. I think the biggest one, too, is the synergy between the husband and wife, like Pastor Pastor Bola, they called out earlier. I mean, if wife wants to do it and the husband is not in support, there could be an issue and vice versa, too. (laughs) question just like what pastor Bumi said how do you find the balance between like safety or reason and logic and just obeying blindly because like I've heard testimonies of people that say like I came to this country I knew nobody and this random person helped me and I will always like be indebted to that person and I saw God in that situation versus like how led Wait, can we get her? Right. Right. So just be led. Alrighty. So the question was, how do we balance logic?
logic and reason versus being led, and Pastor Bumi emphasized the yeah, part on being perfect. led. Can we have a microphone? Oh. So I think logic is not even the word to be using in this scenario. You need to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, and he needs to guide you. There are people that have obeyed blindly, and they became blind. Let me put it that way. So, I, I don't even know, because you're, if you don't have a relationship with God, like you're just using your head knowledge to make decisions, and that, that's usually not the best way to go. You can take people into your home, just, but just make sure that you are walking hand in hand with the Holy Spirit as you're making those moves. God will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, so again, emphasis on letting the Holy Spirit guide us. If a need arises and you have doubts, you really got to be in line, in alignment with the Spirit. Uh, honestly, I, I believe, yeah, we can let the Holy Spirit uh, guide us. But there are certain situations where we don't need to over-spiritualize doing good, right? So because that's, that's also the same excuse some people use not to help others. I'm still waiting to hear from God. You see somebody with a clear need and you are still praying and asking God, when God has given you the money to be able to do it. So, while I'm not saying we shouldn't be led by the Spirit, there are so, those random good thoughts to do good that drop in our hearts. You don't need to over-rationalize those ones. But like Pastor Bumi said, I mean, the point of bringing somebody into your home, that's a difficult one in this age and time to do randomly. However, there's an alternative to it. I can drive you to the nearest Motel, pay $50 or $80 or $100 for you to pass the night. Like the man who met that Samaritan, he gave them money to put him in an inn till he was well. So there's an alternative to that also if you really want to help. You view the lady, so they built a place separate from the other. Separate, they built it. I'm not saying don't bring people home. For example, if I'm meeting someone off the street, and something I saw some video, I think late last year, where a lady found uh, one guy um, on the street, brought him home, cleaned him up, and of course they started having um, a relationship, and he killed the lady. And he killed the lady. So this is what I'm saying. For example, you meet someone off on the street, and you say, come, somebody had walked into the restaurant before, can I sleep here? No, you cannot, because if you sleep here, something happened to you, then I get into trouble. You have to go and look for a place. There was a particular church that would let, they have um, a building where, rooms where people usually will sleep over. I said, you can go to that place, they will accommodate you. But I cannot go beyond what is allowed. For example, you cannot lock somebody inside here and there's nobody here. You can't. Because then it becomes a, a big problem if the um, the system will now find out that somebody was locked up in the restaurant. And of course, I wouldn't give the person my key. So what am I saying? You can do it, but I think the question you asked was, why would you not allow a stranger into your home? Not just being hospitable, period, if, I, if I'm correct. Uh -huh. Allowing a stranger into your home. Like Pastor Balade said, you can go get an Airbnb for a month or a week or however, whatever money you can afford. Or you can take them to an hotel. But picking somebody from the streets that you do not know, that doesn't stop us from being hospitable. It doesn't stop us from lending hand to that person. But you probably won't bring that person home immediately. You would want to even have a relationship somehow with this person before you would bring a total stranger to your home because of safety of your family too. Thank you. I know we are coming up at time. Um, so just to quickly summarize, it's really important to let the spirit direct you on how to be hospitable. It's not always opening up your home. It could look like giving water like to someone's camels. And, you know, camels in New York, but whatever the camels are. Um, <laughs> they're dogs, <laughs> yes. Um, so really, again, letting the Holy Spirit guide you. In all of these lessons, if we got pretty um, excited at the, when I asked about the excuses that we could come up with, whereas like the rest of the lesson, we were you know, not as lively. Um, but really, like, 
spend time with the lesson, pray and ask God, like, how can I continue to serve in your kingdom, to be hospitable, to live a life that demonstrate your, demonstrates your love and your glory um, in the work that I'm doing for my brothers and sisters. So with that, we will call on Sister Vaughn and Leigh to pray us out. Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this time, Treasures from Heaven. We thank you for all that we've learned about hospitality. Lord, I pray for grace that we would be led by you in all our decisions in the name of Jesus. Um, we pray for our teacher, Jay, that you continue to bless her with your wisdom, Lord. We also commit the rest of his service into your hands, Lord, that, Lord, we would constantly be blessed as well. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.